So why did Prabhupada stress the study of Srimad Bhagavatam for our children? Because it creates a child, which an all-round child, who's expert both materially and spiritually. Prabhupada knew that the study of Srimad Bhagavatam is so powerful that a children not only you know, becomes a pure devotee, but also materially he benefits greatly. Prabhupada wanted our children not only to become, uh, you know, preachers and, and be engaged in devotional service, but he also wanted them to become good citizens and good leaders in society. And he felt very convinced that the study of Srimad Bhagavatam will give training both materially and spiritually. Why? Because Srimad Bhagavatam covers all subject matters. And because it, it the, the study of Srimad Bhagavatam evokes curiosity about life and uh, in, invokes critical thinking skills and good reasoning skills, a child naturally, you know, learns the art of going very deep into a subject matter, to looking at the world in a very critical way. When a child studies Srimad Bhagavatam, he's not going to take everything blindly, what people tell him, what the world outside believes in, or whatever he learns in his educational institution. He's going to look at things from the perspective, from a spiritual perspective. And that's the beauty of Srimad Bhagavatam. It permeates in a child's life in every area of, the, of his life, whether material or spiritual. So I'm, today, like I um, you know, I promised, I would like to do a specific section of the Bhagavatam and take you through uh, a, you know, a, a practical workshop of how to teach this particular section um, to our children. Now this, the process that I'm gonna describe to you this methodology that I mentioned in my seminar uh, some weeks ago also, it involves, let me uh, share that screen with you. Yeah. So this is the process that I mentioned earlier. The parents or teachers, they read the purpose ahead of time. And they note down the points on the side as to what they would like to discuss with the children. Now, sometimes you note the points, but you may not, at the, that moment, you may think, well, let's go on. I think it's getting, too, um, it's getting too long, or maybe the children, need, we need to move on. So you may, dis make, may make decisions like that. That's okay. But the idea is that by reading the purpose ahead of time, we actually get inspired to teach Bhagavatam to our children. It really helps in that inspiration, um, to our own inspiration, because we are ready for it. We, are, we understand very deeply what, uh, what that story, the morals that that story is giving. And we also understand very deeply the issues that we would like to bring up in terms of, in relation with our, our life, in relation with the life, that the world that the children uh, see and, and how to relate it, especially children who are going to school, it becomes very, very valuable. Because in school, as you know, there's a different mood there and a different, the different value system. So by understanding the deeper aspects of these uh, points, the children are able to relate it to their life um, you know, outside the home. Then uh, having done that, we sit together with the children now we can sit in a circle if we have just a few children or we can be in a classroom situation. Of course, at this point with the COVID, we, are, we can, it's an online situation. So we can do that. And I, I do a lot of online classes. I have about a hundred children with batches of 10 or 12 children in each batch, according to their age. And it's amazing that even just uh, online, you know, on um, just through the process of hearing, uh, through the audio, uh, you know, one can really grasp uh, and attract the child's attention. Why? Because the nature of the topic is so, is so good, is so powerful. Is uh, it, it attracts Krishna attracts the hearts of every living entity, and the children because they can t uh, participate in this process. 
because it's in the form of discussion. It is very interactive because they can do the, uh, you know, express themselves, communicate. They find it very, very um, enlightening. If children were to sit down and just listen to us, naturally they will be bored. But when they are active participants to this discussion, the int intelligence is sharpened and they are able to think and reason and critically analyze situations. And they feel great pride in being able to give their own opinion. And also, and they become humble to hear other people's, other children's opinions as well. So uh, we open it for discussion from time to time. As we've, if we've read the purpose ahead of time, we know, we feel confident that we can bring up certain issues and we can start discussing them. Now, there's many ways to do that, you know, and everybody may find a, their own creative way to do something. So there's no any particular, uh, you know, fixed way. But overall, the principles are that we, as the children's attraction to Krishna develops, then we make the questions more on the how level rather than the what level. In other words, we just, we don't say always that what happened now. And in other words, we don't just talk about the, the plot of the story, you know that this happened and this happened, but we'd rather open, uh, you know, go deeper into it, why this is happening. And we also learn to contrast, right? So uh, there are certain points that I wrote down which help a teacher or a parent to, to teach, you know? We, our, our discussion should be in such a way that we encourage our children to ask questions and to raise questions and to make comments. So frequently, as we discuss some deep point, we wait, we stop, and we open it for others to make comments, okay? We don't rush to it, but it, because uh, children like to, um, it helps them to actually discuss one point rather than rushing to another point. And then actually what happens is one point leads to another point, and then leads to another point, and very soon you will realize that you've discussed many, many important things. And if you don't know the answer to a particular question, don't be afraid to say that you don't know. And actually it becomes a great opportunity at that point to go deeper, maybe read one purpose somewhere which has the answer to that question. So the child knows, well, my teacher, she knows a lot more, but yet it's, it's not like we know everything and how Prabhupada is the, gives the answer to every question through the Srimad Bhagavatam. So uh, try, and then we try to relate the story to daily life, you know, sometimes, not all the time, like we don't want to continuously relate it to a practical life because sometimes we have to be careful in that process because in children, we don't want to, to corner the children or point fingers at them, you know? For example, you know, in the case of Dhruva's story, you know, Suruchi uh, was very, very harsh to Dhruva. She displays some very, very bad qualities. We don't point a finger at the child and say, well, remember that time when you also got upset and you lost your temper and you got angry with your brother? No, these type of discussions, they become very, very detrimental to a child and the child backs off and thinks, well, I don't want to read the Srimad Bhagavatam because then, you know, I, I am presented to be, I'm shown to be a bad boy. So we don't want to do that, right? We discuss the story as it is, the nature of Suruchi, the nature of Suniti, and we can compare that and bring it to light how one type of behavior is so beneficial and so leads to success versus another type of behavior. So, uh, so but, we can, but to a certain extent, we can, sometimes we can bring it to practical life, right? Um, for example, we can say that how you know, in the point where Shringi, you know, uh, dis you know, cursed, cursed Parikshit Maharaj, right? And that anger was, we can discuss as being really, really, how it's bad anger, right? But there is also something like good anger. Right? So we can take the examples from scriptures when a devotee has described, uh, displayed anger, which has been actually very good and beneficial. So in other words, anger also can be used in the service of the Lord. Right? So we make comparisons like that. Okay, in Dhruva's case, um, you know, uh, Dhruva displayed anger when he was killing Yaksha or Suruchi having lost her sense of, you know, uh, equality and kindness and compassion. 
and, and displayed uh, harsh behavior. But then we see Suniti in contrast, how she displayed behavior of great patience and um, reflection and integrity. So in this way, we, we can make comparisons for the child. And this way, the child learns very clearly that, okay, well, this is bad anger, but this is good anger, okay? And and it can in, and that itself will the will, he will be able to imbibe it in his own life when he learns the difference between good anger and bad anger he's able to take those teachings to heart through the medium of the scriptures. Okay. So um, and then in the end we have a realizations class and that's really the most fun part where the child having heard for for several weeks you know, uh, uh, the story, then he's ready to reflect. He's ready to talk. He's ready to give his own comments. And I tell you, it is the most exciting part of the study of Bhagavatam is when the child can think very deeply of all the things he's learned and then and is, be, is able to give his own comments on that point. So uh, realization brings the whole thing to a conclusion where the child feels very, very um, very, very um, satisfied, right? Now I suggest that there should be a realizations class after every class, a short one, but sometimes if the time doesn't allow it, because you, if you've given yourself one hour and there's so many children and so much to discuss and you realize that there's not enough time, then, uh, you know, and if, the, if there's been a lot of discussion during the class, you know, and reflection, then we can skip it. But in general, it's nice to end with a, short realizations, but in the end of the story of the entire Dhruva story, chapter rather, like if you do chapter eight, then at the end of the chapter eight, one can have a realization class. Okay. Ma. 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 No. Your neck, your neck feeling because of this, nothing else. Okay. So I think somebody needs to mute there. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe they can turn the video off. We can see the video. Okay, so then, um, okay, so I think pretty much uh, we got all these points of, um, okay, and, and one other thing, and I know these questions come up later, but one other point is that don't feel bad if you don't haven't read Srimad Bhagavatam before you were teaching the child. Because as adults, we, we have more experience than the children. And so we'll always be able to share our life's experiences to them. And we, and, the, and we will always be teachers to them. So in fact, when we read with the children, we advance also simultaneously. And we should think of our time with them as a time like we would spend with an adult reading Srimad Bhagavatam. We should not see any difference between uh, studying Srimad Bhagavatam with adults versus children. We can get as absorbed and relish the nectar and, and, and the nectar of, these, uh, of the scripture, even with children. And that has been my experience teaching so many children um, over the years, as well as my own children. I realized how nectarian it is and how there is no lack of absorption or, uh, or the results that we experience after learning such profound things. So we already went through all that, the different age groups and how to teach them and how to go deeper and deeper. So today I want to focus on the Guru story. So, um, I, I want to take this one example of chapter eight of the fourth canto and bring to light um, certain questions or um, things that we can bring up. You know, uh, as you, all of you know, I'm sure you read this chapter before this meeting. So as we know, this little boy Dhruva, who's only five years old, he's, he was the son of the less favored wife of the king, King Uttanapad. And he was trying one day as the king was sitting uh, and his other son, this, the son of his favorite queen, Suruchi, was on the king's lap. Little Dhruva was trying to get up on his father's lap as well, which is very natural. And his father uh, was feeling 
you know, wasn't feeling any, any way different to his son Dhruva. And, and he instinctively, instinctively wanted to reach out to Dhruva and pick, it up, pick him up and put him on his lap. But at that very minute, Suruchi was just incensed with envy. And just by her body language, she was making it very clear that she did not want the king to reach out to Dhruva to pick him up. And, and as you know, she spoke very, very harsh words to Dhruva. And her harsh words totally broke Dhruva's heart. And what did she say? She said that, um, you know, as a, if you have a desire to sit on your father's lap, that is not possible. And if you have a desire to become king, even that's not possible. In other words, everything was finished for Dhruva. She was making it very clear that he actually had no future, neither as a son of the king, who was rightfully his father, nor as, as the future king, which was really his claim. He was being the elder, he had claim to the throne. So taking, being very weak at heart, the king forgot his religious principles and he did not chastise her or say anything to her and did not reach out for Dhruva, to Dhruva. Seeing his father's attitude, Dhruva became very, very unhappy and became actually very angry. It says in uh, one of the texts early on, it says that he felt, you know, like a snake, you know, is when he's agitated, you know, and is ready to bite. He was hissing like a snake due to anger. You know, when a snake gets angry, he starts hiss hissing. Um, and he was hissing like a snake. So that analogy is very interesting and that can be discussed uh, briefly. And, and, the, and Dhruva, um, um, he went to his mother, as we know. His mother was shocked and she, of, of course, she could not really know anything because Dhruva was hysterical. And when she found that what happened from the guards, then she became very, very sad as well. So we have to understand how the study of Bhagavatam really uh, becomes effective through the study of analogies and uh, through the study of analogies. Just one second, please. So we can do that through the study of analogies. Um, and that becomes a very effective way of teaching the abstract concepts that is presented in the Bhagavatam. You know, today in schools, a great effort and, uh, is being made to teach children these concepts, these abstract concepts. And, and this is so easily taught because it helps in the, in the critical thinking skills. And this is so easily taught through Bhagavatam, you know, and through the study of these different analogies. I mentioned in my seminar um, some time ago that these, um, these uh, analogies helps in understanding, in understanding very difficult spiritual concepts through material examples. Right? And um, for example, we heard about, you know, um, for example, how to teach children different concepts like uh, simple analogies, like uh, when Prabhupada says that he is the mailman who simply delivers the letter. A mailman doesn't open a letter, right? So it's a very picturesque metaphor where the child can use his imagination to think of a mailman who delivers letters and how Prabhupada is compared to a mailman because he doesn't open the letter. He doesn't change what Krishna is saying. Right? So the other thing, the other one, this is called a metaphor, right? The other is like a figurative speech where one is, um, for example, when um, is when devotee bhakti is compared to a, a seed, you know, a seed, a devotional seed. When we water the seed through the process of hearing and chanting, this it grows into a creeper, which becomes longer and longer and ultimately finds shelter at the lotus feet of Krishna. Right? It's so picturesque, it's so figurative, right? So these analogies help the child just open up their imagination and their creative abilities. And it helps in their understanding of language, you know, uh, of language skills, as well as in terms of understanding difficult concepts through easy examples. 
And as a child gets older, these analogies get more and more difficult and he's able to grasp them. It's amazing. You know, if you start the children out with Bhagavatam early on, by the time they're six and seven, they can actually understand very deep concepts, very, very deep concepts. For example, there's an analogy that Prabhupada mentions of, um, uh, you know, how the subtle body, you know, the time of death, the subtle body leaves the gross body and goes into another body. It's a subtle body that uh, carries the soul into another body. Now, the subtle body is made of mind, intelligence, and ego, and the mind is where all the material desires are contained. And so, naturally, whatever our desires are at the time of death, those, the subtle body carries those desires, and, give, and in this way, we get a new body. So that is very wonderfully explained by Prabhupada in, an, in the analogy of how when we sleep, you know, and we are dreaming, we're dreaming that we are somewhere in this beautiful place, you know, maybe flying, you know, on top of a mountain or something. So how the subtle body, you know, our physical body is lying down, but our subtle body is taking that soul, uh, that carries the soul into that body. And then because the body is not dead and is still alive, the subtle body brings the soul back and we wake up, you see? It was really a, a very nice uh, way to explain how that happens, you know? So, uh, so you see, this, uh, now this analogy is getting more and more difficult. From easy, it's becoming more and more difficult. But these concepts are easier to understand through these ana analogies, metaphors, and things like that, right? So uh, there's one other example of, uh, you know, of a coconut. I may have mentioned that, you know, how a coconut an unripe coconut is one, is solid one piece, whereas a ripe coconut, the inner shell, inner pulp separates from the outer shell, right? So this is when a devotee matures in spiritual life, he separates from his material body, right? So it's very nice, it's very picturesque. The child understands you could even have a coconut in front of you and you can see how the body, you know, the material body, um, you know, separates, you know. Um, he leaves behind the material body and his body becomes spiritual. So things like that, very, very, and of course the basic analogy of the car uh, and the driver compared to the difference between the body and soul, you know, that we keep hearing that. But it, it helps develop the foundational principles of Krishna consciousness for children. Right? So we should not be afraid of tackling these examples, should not be afraid of tackling these uh, exam uh, analogies, not think, okay, well, we need to skip it because this may be too difficult for the children to understand. No, as teachers, let us take the time out and understand these analogies and, and learn the process of how to present it because children in the process will become very, very intelligent. Not only are they going to understand spiritual, difficult spiritual concepts and, and develop their faith and identity as devotees, not only that, and also help in the process of becoming pure devotees, but also they will be able to understand, um, you know, the process of, um, you know, of, uh, you know, develop their intellect, their ability for good reasoning, logic, you know, and they will actually become good at, uh, you know, at debate, actually, even, even when we put challenges to them, because it's, it's sharpening a, a part of the brain, which, which is wants to reason and, and think, okay? So that's another aspect of how we develop this ability in them to debate, to argue, to, um, I mean, to put up a good fight, um, you, know, you know, good fight with those who are, those who, have, who do not believe in God, you know, the atheists, to with those who are Mayavadis, to those who are mental speculators, to those, you know, people like that, you know, to hardcore materialists, how to present an argument. And there's a side in our children, a side in all children who love to fight. Right? So how do, we, how do we engage this quality of challenge and fighting that these children have is through the process of uh, discussion, through the process of debate, of playing devil's advocate. Right? I mentioned that earlier in, in my seminar, right? So we do this process of, through Bhagavatam. And what will happen in the real world, what will happen is that they will not take anything lying down. They will not believe in, will not do blind thinking. Later on, as they go into college, everything that taught there is, imper is on the level of impersonalism. You know, when my children went to college, you know, and they, 
they had to take a philosophy class, humanities class. It was shocking. All the philosophy was basically impersonalist. You know, and, it's, and the way they presented and the way, you know, they, it, it's very attractive and it's very, um, it, it's, it, it feels very, very uh, right. Okay? It's easy to fall pr prey to them and, and think that, well, this is, everybody believes in this, so it must be true. Right? But with the training that Bhagavatam gives, children are not going to take that line down. Right? Because of the training that you're giving them from day on. So, um, and this quality of impulsism is not only just when they take classes. This quality of, of this uh, impulsism that's permeating in every aspect of society, it, it can uh, permeate in their own personal lives and in, in their dealings with others. Everything is becoming so automated. Everything is becoming so impersonal. And so children who are raised with this kind of study, they become very personal by nature. They will become very compassionate. They see individual people, they see people as not as machines, but as people, you know? They develop, for example, in the, in the story of Dhruva, the quality of compassion, the quality of gratefulness, all these things are so clearly shown, right? So coming back to the story, the story of Dhruva, you know, so we have this contrast of Dhruva's uh, mother, real mother, Suniti's versus Dhruva's stepmother, right? That contrast is clearly there. I remember when we, I did this with many, many groups of children over the years, then we see, we discussed so many things, the quality of envy, of course, you know, how bad envy is versus the quality of compassion and, um, you know, uh, that was displayed by Suniti, right? One of the questions that children came up with, I think in one, in one of my seminars, a mother asked was, how come, Shatri, you know, Uttanapal had two wives. What is this concept of stepmother, you know? And the parent was saying that he, she didn't know what to say. Like, it was a very odd question, how to explain why a man ma gets married to two people, two women, right? It becomes a little complicated, right? But we see in today's society, at least in America, a lot, that how people get married and they leave their wife or, and they get married to another. And so a child grows up having two mothers. One real mother who's been, you know, who's already gone and, you know, who has, um, is not married to his father anymore. And then a stepmother. So this concept of having a stepmother and many brothers, so many half brothers and things are very much prominent in society today. So, and the child going to school is exposed to that, you know where he's, which he has a friend who says, well, he's, you know, his mother's living with somebody else and, and his uh, stepmother is with, lives with him. So, so this concept is not unusual. And then of course we explain the actual, why um, the king is allowed to marry more than one, more than one wife, right? And how the, these kings were very, very responsible, you know, where they were, uh, they were able to take care of all their wives, you know? And, uh, you know, for example, in Vedic culture, polygamy was only allowed only when there was respect for women. Polygamy was never allowed when women are disrespected, which we see in today's society, right? When a man goes through many, many women and discards one after another, then that's out of, um, not out of respect, but it's just the other way around, it's a disrespect. So, so in other words, these are the deeper aspects. Of course, you may not be able to, uh, for the child to understand these things, but they were done under great responsibility for, with full care, with full responsibility of taking care of, of the king to care of all of his wives. And he treated them equally, mostly, you know, but we have stories like this, right? And this is human nature, the frailty of human nature. So these things can be explained to the children. We don't have to shy away from them. We see their level, we see what they can accept, but it's amazing. You know, sometimes we really don't give our children enough credit for, for, for be able to understand that world is not black and white, <laughs> but instead the world is many shades of gray. So, but to, to understand the nature of this world, 
through the eyes of Shastra is a much better way than to actually experience it, right? So if you learn about the frailties of human nature that we see again and again in the Srimad Bhagavatam and how each one in the, as a, with that frailty is able to overcome that frailty and to actually become successful after that, that is the beauty of Srimad Bhagavatam. We don't shy away we don't hide them from these frailties, but rather we tackle them. And because these stories are, are not um, are very selective, you know, Srimad Bhagavatam is not a chronological history of uh, history of, of Vedic history, but rather is the history of great personality, only special great personalities that we can learn from and perfect our life, right? So in this way, the stories are meant for the children to be able to actually learn through them, to see these, uh, to see some of these personalities as, as frail, but at the same time to be able to overcome their frailty. Right? So, so one thing I want to emphasize is that don't be afraid or shy of any issue that comes up, tackle it, because the world will show, it shows them, will show them anyway, especially if they're going to school and even if they're at home. The world is such, is designed in such a way that one will, one will face these things, no matter what. And hearing from Shastra gives a proper perspective, a proper perspective, okay? Okay, so that's one thing. And then uh, there's other questions that come up, right? Um, the quality of, um, you know, why Suruchi suffered a heavy reaction, but the king did not. And that's a very deep point in the story, isn't it? And believe it or not, as you're doing that first chapter or the second chapter, you'll see how children will come up with these questions. But these are only a few questions that I have here, very few. There's many, many more, right? So, and, and in fact, it will be the children. You should uh, have Bhagavan in such a way the child is thinking, well, why did the king marry more than one wife? Oh, why did the king, uh, you know, why, why did Suri, I, I get this question, all the time from children. Why did uh, Suruchi have to die and Uttama have to die? You know, why did Uttama have to die? After all, he was a little boy. He didn't do anything, you know? So all these things, and these are, you know, not easy answers, right? Of course, Suruchi, we understand, it was a heavy reaction, you know, for something that she, something very serious that she did. And it, you know, there's so many lessons there, right? She, she, um, she suffered this reaction because of her friends to Dhruva at a time that she didn't even know that Dhruva was such a great soul. But yet we understand from that lesson that when we make offenses to a devotee, even if the devotee may be a child, you know, we, we, we will suffer reaction from that because we don't know who these children are, what kind of great souls they are. So, so many things open up. Suruchi, he's, she suffers a heavy reaction, but the king does not suffer. Why? Because he was very remorseful. But we don't hear of Suruchi being remorseful, right? The king left his kingdom. He was lamenting day and night. All he could think of was his little Dhruva. Right? He left all attraction to ruling, to kingdom, everything. He was very remorseful. And in the beginning, we did hear about him naturally wanting to give the same affection to Dhruva, but he was stopped by, um, you know, due to weakness of heart, right? So the king doesn't, right? And then of course we hear Uttama also dying, but that's Krishna's desire. Ultimately, is Krishna's will, how he wants to play the cards, right? So ultimately the question comes that ultimately even the reaction is up to Krishna. You know, we all have to suffer some karma, but the reaction, but what Krishna does with that karma is up to him, right? So in this way, we, we, the children learn that ultimately we can't um, find the cause of, for everything because Krishna is Krishna's desire. And we, there's many examples in scriptures where even the great demigods bow down when Krishna desires something. You know, for example, when, uh, um, you know, when, when in the story of Rita Sura, when the, uh, when the, um, the demigods were losing, then um, then it was Ritasura, uh, then the, 
what was I saying? Yeah, when the demigods were losing, then uh, at that time they went to Brahma and they, they wanted to get some help. And Brahma said, well, you've already done the offense. Indra has already done the offense of offending his, uh, his spiritual master, Brahaspati. Now you have to just wait for the time when Krishna decides to reverse those results. So you have to suffer the consequences, right? The demigods understand that now it's up to Krishna. There's nothing they can do. Even though they are so powerful administrators, they're actually helpless in front of the Lord. Right? Okay, so then uh, we hear about, um, so uh, this way we can go on and on and, in, and learn these uh, nice lessons, right? So we hear about Suniti, how she established Parampara, how so expertly we see in the character of Suniti, not only her childish innocence, where she, where she directs Dhruva to the forest and she says, well, I've heard that great sages go and do penance in the forest. So you should also go there. So she's heard that sages go to Madhuvan and they pray to Krishna over there. So she's directing to Krishna, uh, Dhruva, to, uh, Dhruva to, to the forest from hearing what she has heard, right? So she's a simple lady, but at the same time, she's very, very sharp. She understands that she develops that faith in her son that she must, that if he has material desires, if he wants to ascend to the throne, he must take help from Krishna. He must go and please Krishna. She's understood that. Her integrity towards Krishna, her chastity towards Krishna is unparalleled. And she directs her son accordingly. So this is a point that comes very, very deep. And we, and we teach our children how chastity to Krishna is ultimately the best chastity. Because of her chastity towards Krishna, because of her faith that only Krishna can solve her problem, she saved her son from committing uh, many, many um, you know, from her, from her, his, from his suffering, basically, right? Her, her, her faith in Krishna. She was able. So we learn from the story that ultimately the solution to all material problems is spiritual solution, is surrender to Krishna. And here we see that clearly, a problem that is materially overwhelming. None of us are ever going to experience anything even close to that, right? She was rejected by the king. Her son was also rejected by the king. You know? And here we see um, how, you know, a, a totally desperate situation for her. And yet she took that very unfortunate situation and made it so very fortunate. So we teach our children how no matter what kind of problems we have, we should see it as the mercy of the Lord. We, sh we should see it as the will of the Lord. And if we just turn towards him, then Krishna will help. So, uh, and here in one of the purpose, Prabhupada, uh, I mean, describes, yes, Prabhupada describes how Suniti is telling Dhruva that, look, as a mother, I cannot help you. I'm helpless. I'm the rejected queen of your father. But if you go to Krishna, he's equal to millions of mothers. And the child starts thinking, wow, you know, I have this mother and I love her so much and she's my mother. But Krishna is like millions of mothers who can fulfill every kind of desire. So, so in this way, the child, is, his faith in Krishna is getting deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Through this story where he understands that ultimately there's no greater, kinder master than Krishna. Because look at Krishna, what he did versus Suniti. He gave him everything that he wanted maturely, and then also everything spiritually. So, um, so in this way, we can take the children step by step through this whole thing, through the whole story. Right? And then of course, there's other comments here that I would like to make, just a couple more. Uh, for example, lamentation. You know, we hear in one of the puppets in the first chapter, how Instead of just lamenting, you know, when Dhruva came running to his mother, his mother could have just cried and fr get frustrated and told Dhruva, you know, when you grow up, then you can fight back. This is really mean what your father is doing and what your stepmother is doing. She could have been frustrated. She could have been angry. 
No, instead she directed him to the right path. She said, look, your father, I mean, your grandfather, Swambu Mano, he, he, he became Mano only because of his austerities and pleasing the Lord. He got everything material. He became the grandfather, he became the Manu of this entire universe, right? Look at your great grandfather. Through his austerities, he's, he has the entire universe at his command. So even you, if you do austerities, you can please the Lord, right? So instead of lamenting, she directs him to make something out of his sadness, out of his disappointment, to actually become, uh, to actually engage in Krishna's service. So we, so the children learn determination. Of course, one of the lessons we learn from the Duba story is determination. Right? And then the last question can be for more uh, older children. You know, Suniti, how she became glorified, how no, how ultimately, no material situation is um, can be a detriment uh, for any devotee. You know, if he has faith in Krishna, if he has chastity for Krishna. Uh, no, no living entity, no matter how bad her material or his material circumstances may be, is is um, is really neglected if he's if she or he is not neglected by the Lord. When one is neglected by the Lord Himself, that would be considered the greatest misfortune. So, in this way, we see that how the biggest in impediment in life can be a source of great encouragement for the devotee. So I think I will uh, stop here and see if anybody has any questions. I thought I was going to read all the different verses to you and see and take you through, but I think it's just going to take a lot of time. So I decided to, uh, you know, do it like this, you know, just discuss the general points of how we can do this. So this is the uh, learning the spiritual lessons, you know, how in general, we learn these points, these lessons, and there's many more. Don't be envious of others. If you desire something, ask Krishna. Tolerate and act with integrity. Integrity means integrity towards Krishna. In other words, at no point did the mother and son forget Krishna. At no point, right? And, and what was the result? Dhruva went back to God and so did his mother. So it's a great lesson for us mothers and fathers that if when we if we give a right uh, training to our children, right? If we teach them through shastra, then not only do they benefit, but we also benefit in the process. Right? Be determined and focused by devotional service. We can change the whole world. Krishna is very kind and compassionate, and these are only a few. There's, like I said, there's many, many more of these lessons. So anyone who may have read this chapter eight, if you have any uh, things that you wanted to ask, maybe you noted the points or something and you would like to ask at this point, please feel free to do that now. Hare Krishna. Yes, Mavi. Thank you so much for the wonderful demo class. We request the participants to kindly raise your hands virtually in case you have uh, any doubts or queries. Arajani Mataji, can you please unmute yeah. yourself and ask? Yeah, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, Mataji, please can I ask you a question regarding the previous class which you had given teaching Bhagavatam? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's all related, so it's not a problem. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mataji, my son is four and a half year old and I tell him stories uh, from small books like of Vaikuntha Enterprises. There is a There are small books 
uh, of dhruv maharaj and uh, pralhad maharaj and i have started like that so for him can i continue the same or should i start with bhagavatam he is just four and a half year old oh yeah it's okay because he is very young and so i mean at four and a half i did i do begin uh, from shrimad bhagavatam prabhupada shrimad bhagavatam so you can try that as well and see because what you do is he cannot read but you can read to him and then explain uh, frequently stop and paraphrase and explain what you're reading with a very active uh, you know in a very imaginative way you know you can you know with kind of actions and things also like uh, i i think i played a video last uh, audio last time of a group in london that was doing it for very young children where they you know he the way they acted out and things you know so you can actually do a, where you can actually do a an acting out with a child and bringing home those points or you speak in a way that is very dramatical so in this way you get the benefit of reading from shila prabhupada's books right you get that benefit uh from you know the, because these books of shila prabhupada they're very very potent they're actually very potent so when you read directly from them the power that you experience i mean the the reciprocation that you experience is a lot more you see because of the nature of these potency of these books so i would encourage if you can do it it may not be very long even with those other books i'm sure you cannot do too long at a time anyway right so why not do with yes. shila prabhupada yeah so take some uh, some uh, action filled story you know to get him to also get excited for example you could do i mean dhruva story is great great you know because the child does feel very very heavily for little dhruva and feels oh you know look at what happened to him and feels that you know pain and then of course it's exciting also because he leaves home and and all that so or you can do the story of gajendra and the crocodile right you can do that story or you can do the story of pralad you know so there's many many stories like that so i would i would uh, see if you can do that you know uh okay. thank you mandaji thank you so much hari krishna shweta gopi mata ji to kindly raise a question hari krishna mata ji mata ji uh, i would like to ask you like uh, in today's lecture you were speaking about uh, the karma which uh, came about on the suruchi and uh, his son uttanapad so hmm. suruchi as you said you know that it was a little bit you know we can understand that you know the karma part how it affected but then uh, when we have this question of course even hmm. i had this question when you were speaking that uh, hmm. how about uh, the son uttanapad yeah you mean the son uttama Oh, ah, yeah. sorry. Yeah, the son. Yeah, the son. Of yeah. So the 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 point is that you know Suruchi, uh, due to the her son's death, she became mad and she went to search for him. You know, and then a forest fire consumed her. Right. This is the story how it goes. So mm-hmm. obviously, uh, her madness came after her son was dead. Right. And then she that led to her own death. Right. So this is like part of Krishna's plan. Right. To to uh, give heavy reaction to suruchi you know like is and then the way we explain that we don't know we don't know what is krishna's will and desire we simply surrender to it right like for example in the story of the pandavas you know they were going through so many reverses at one point even yudhishthira maharaj got shaken up and said look krishna we are totally surrendered to you but yet we see that we are suffering all these reverses in life you know and and how is it and at that point krishna says that when i'm merciful to someone you know i i i give it whatever they want but when i'm very very merciful to someone i give my special favor then i take things away from them you see so in other words ultimately is up to krishna and a devotee simply surrenders because we cannot fathom to know everything what krishna desires you see so is krishna's way of being merciful to suruchi you know in a way uh, because that led to her purification in a way you know so and how krishna designs that how krishna plans that out nobody can know okay mm-hmm. yes 
Yes. Thank you, Mataji. Mataji, one more question. The even the other devotees want to ask uh, is mm -hmm. that uh, Mataji, uh, like, what do you? How can we decide? You know, uh, is it upon the age of the child or maybe the understanding? that uh, do we take the i mean the story forms of shrimad bhagavatam you know the main stories uh, the randomly or uh, chapter by chapter okay yes um, yeah so it depends on the development of the child if the child is uh, being exposed to bhagavatam just is new to bhagavatam or just being exposed to it then we um, then we do from the stories because then starting from the first canto will be a little difficult because there's mm -hmm. fewer stories. I mean, there's a lot of stories in the first canto as well. You know, we have the story of Narad Muni and Vyasadev, you know, and, and towards the end, we have the Queen Kunti's uh, mm -hmm. prayer, mm -hmm. they passing away yeah. and all these things mm -hmm. are there. However, in the beginning, in the early on in the chapters, it's difficult because there's a lot more philosophy than stories. So in the beginning, what I suggest is that you start with the story. And then when you see that the child is developing a, a great attraction to the process of understanding these deeper points, then you could go go to Canto One, Chapter One. You know, just give yourself a little time, do a few stories, uh, develop that attraction in the children, and then you can then the child will have no problem doing Canto One, Chapter One. But if you want to do Canto One, Chapter One, it can be done. You know, if you want to begin, then I would say we have many nice guidebooks that we are creating for different cantos. And you can use them for help. I see right now we are working on Canto Four, and the story of Dhruva. We've already that we discussed today, the first chapter. Uh, we already have it. We already have worked on it. In fact, we are halfway through the fourth canto. So we have three cantos uh, already done. So if anybody wants to do that, it, you, it's just that when it's so much philosophy, you have to really be very creative. Uh, and the guidebook is of great help, the Srimad Bhagavatam guidebook, because it gives that philosophy through the form of stories. It helps with that. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Mataji. I would like to request Medhavni Marji to please raise her question. Hare Krishna Mataji, uh, thank you for the very wonderful session. Uh, like as always, it was very uh, useful. So um, I, I had a question that uh, you know my daughters are fourteen and eleven, and uh, all four of us actually read uh, one one book. Like uh, one person reads Chaitanya Charitamrita, one person reads Bhagavad Gita, one person reads Bhagavatam. We try to uh, cover one verse, a uh, translation, and purport. So we've been doing that for quite some time now. But what I realize is that. Um, Sometimes it, it gets like quite mechanical because sometimes nobody wants to share anything. And uh, because we've been doing it for quite some time now and the children, uh, they know the concept and, uh, you know, uh, so how do we maintain the enthusiasm to read and share, Mataji? Because they go to Gopal's Garden School, so they know the fundamentals and everything. But then as we read together, uh, sometimes uh, they don't want to share any points. You know, sometimes you have to prod and, uh, you know, they say that, yeah, we, we've read today, like that it becomes a little mechanical. So how do we like create that enthusiasm and keep it up, Mataji? Can you suggest yes. some? Yeah, so uh, is the process like going fast or is it just one verse that you're discussing? So, um, so what uh, we uh, depends on the, like the purport is long. Then we, uh, then we do uh, like the purport is about a page or so. Then we do one verse translation and purport. But if it is a Bhagavad Gita shloka or Chaitanya Charitamrita, generally uh, in in the initial uh, the, we are in the we are in Adi Lila. We've just started the you know we are in the uh, uh, fifth chapter. So there are no purports actually. So what we do two, three verses together because the initial verses are Jai Jai Chaitanya Prabhu Nityana, that one, you know. So we just uh, read all about 10 verses, but there are no purports at all. So it is just like you read 10 verses and the translation and then you finish. One person finishes. And then I read the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, if I, So we are in the fourth chapter. So we've read the Bhagavad Gita before. For also, so we are just doing a second. Uh, we are actually doing the third time of the Bhagavad Gita. So you know the they don't and and then the next person like Prabhuji starts Bhagavatam. We are doing the uh, we are doing the second kind of Bhagavatam. So wherever there's a long purport, then you know if there's something to discuss, they say something. Otherwise, they say yeah, we already read this, so we can just quickly go ahead. You know, so there are no. So sometimes it becomes like sounds a little mechanical that we are just reading 
one or two verses and uh, you know we know that we have the knowledge because we've read it but then that enthusiasm uh, to discuss and you know to get more realizations that is not happening mataji so what is it that we are lacking yeah yeah so um i think what happens is that with children uh, they need to keep moving and so if you have just one verse that you're doing and just opening it for discussion that becomes harder because they are children and if there is a story that keeps going and moving then they they you can catch um, you can trap their attention much more effectively and get them to think more you know and to question and to raise questions and to raise comments so mm-hmm. these things happen more easily when we are moving along you know and also and and relating it to to their life you know to to the character within that story you know um where they can identify with some things uh, or at least they can find the story engaging you see so and and we don't need to um yeah so i i would recommend something like that rather than just focusing on one verse uh and so you know so if you plan ahead of time and you prepare ahead of time then it becomes easier for the teacher because then you realize well this is what we're going to cover today and these are some of the points i'm going to bring up so you're prepared that okay and the points naturally have to be very engaging and very interesting and also very instructive so um is this in a school that you're talking are you a teacher at school yeah oh no mata ji so i'm just doing it uh, you know for my daughters 14 and 11 years old and oh. uh, first like prabhu ji me um, uh, my daughters danya and daita we sit together because that's the last thing we do before we go to sleep so morning yeah. we're chanting and night this is just like a sandwich method which we have adopted but somehow we feel that in the night it's become like a ritual now we just read and then you know we sleep so sometimes the realizations don't come through and uh, sometimes you know it seems to me that we are just reading for the sake of reading you know uh, and uh, generally when we are reading all the four books uh sometimes the purport is completely philosophy and uh, you know and sometimes i feel that they know more than me <laughs> so uh, i am like uh, you tell some points what you know and all that but they are like uh, mummy we already read this uh, so this is the understanding so let's move forward like that mother ji so that uh, enthusiasm is uh, is uh, kind of uh, uh, you know deteriorating so well like i mentioned if you uh, if you try this method maybe that will work better okay so just try this method that i'm you know try this and see uh, because it's more engaging and it helps and and give everybody turns to read keep them in, engaged and and participate in, in the participation uh, i mean in participating with the story so that will really help okay okay mata ji but sometimes there is no story line that is actually coming right like especially well, you have to be okay. then you have to become creative you have to think of different things uh you know where you can discuss you know with through like i i mentioned earlier through examples and things you have to make it more interesting for them through different examples you know how you going to catch their curiosity you know how you going to bring them in to uh identify with these things and to uh you know so you have to just make it very attractive to them so you read ahead of time and see how you can make it attractive just you know because the, these are your children and you can understand and you know what works for them so you just have to employ those things and this process works for everyone all the time i have now i have, I have hundreds of devotees who are who are doing this and of course the process can be changed you know to suit yourself but basically the idea is the same that we engage them and present it in a way that becomes very interesting to them thank you mataji mataji in the initial uh, stages you said uh, you didn't have the time to prepare ahead because you also uh, you know learned along with your yeah. sons ready together so can you share some tips of those days when you had yeah, so the key so the key thing is to uh, to make it interesting and that is the art a mother or father knows naturally you don't have to go to school to understand what works for your children okay so if you haven't had the time to prepare then it still works but you have to make it um make it make it into a way that attracts them you know just like a, a a mother with a small child he she immediately thinks of creative ways of how to make the child happy right and how to engage the child so the child doesn't get starts crying 
So it's those techniques which just comes natural. Okay, if this is the concept about a dry, you know, so-called dry concept, how to make it more interesting. You know, just use your imagination, you know, just even talking about the body and soul. There's so many different ways um, one can talk about that. And it always helps to get inspired yourself. If you're not inspired, then obviously it becomes harder. So while you're cooking or doing your work, you can hear a class or something, get inspired here. And then when the inspiration is there, the next tendency is that you want to share. And who, who can be better people to share than your own children? I see the parents, you know, who are engaged in teaching Bhagavatam and these scriptures to, to the children, they're very inspired because it's like constant preaching. It's like constant, not preaching to them. I don't mean it in that way, you know, but rather through these beautiful stories, you know. So maybe there's lack of inspiration on your part. So maybe you can increase that, you know. And because the children are so much older, I'm sure you have some time to get inspired yourself. And then it, you know, it becomes very natural. You know? uh, I would request Venkatesh Prabhu to kindly ask his question. Able to unmute. Yeah. Hare Krishna Mataji, Dandas Pranams. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you very much, Mataji, for, uh, for this wonderful session. and. Uh, the faith you have in Prabhupada books. Thank you, Prabhu. Prabhu, you have a question? Since he's got logged out, Mataji. Okay. So, uh, till he logs back in, I would like to make an announcement to everyone. Uh, we are having parents also here, Mataji. So, mm -hmm. uh, under the guidance of Her Grace Arudha, Mataji, we are starting the Srimad Bhagavatam class for kids age between 7 to 15 years. Interested parents can register the kids on the link given in the chat box and we'll roll out the links or even on WhatsApp groups. So uh, we hope, hopefully we'll be starting from next week. And uh, we have limited admissions. So then kindly register. It'll be on first come first serve basis. Thank you. Uh, Vankatesh Prabhu is back. I'll just put it. Yeah, the other thing I want to also say that I'm, uh, you know, if the teachers are making these groups to uh, teach uh, once a week to the children, I'm willing to come every week and discuss those, that chapter with you and give you some pointers and give you some, you know, uh, um, you know, clues of how to do it. I, and I'll be happy to do that. So, but, you know, for, for teachers who are actively going to be, you know, doing this with their children or even for parents who, uh, you know, who can, who actively want to do weekly, every week, they follow that chapter every week. So I'm, I'm open, I'm available for that. Yeah. Um, Hare Krishna, Mataji. I'm, I'm back. Yes, um, yes Mataji. Uh, my, uh, my question was, uh, if you, uh, if, uh, now we have seen that uh, children, devotee children, will are quite interested in these stories and they are able to pick up well and they have faith. Uh, but uh, uh, what is your opinion on presenting this uh, kind of a format to a group of non-devotee children who might be like their parents might want these children to take part in uh, this kind of an activity in under some value education kind of a uh, banner? But then uh, will they be able to pick up, uh, Mataji? What is your experience on this? And if yes, then how, how how is it different from presenting to a, a group of a devotee children? Yes, uh, yes, it can be uh, done with the non-devotee children completely the same way. The process is the same, except when you you know we, we can see that the children's uh, knowledge of 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 uh, Krishna is a lot less. Then you accordingly you adapt it. You know, uh, you know you accordingly you. Kid, you know, you make your classes in a way that's more developing their faith rather than going into very deep aspects of uh, of Krishna, of the points, you know, that is that is coming up. You know, you just have to adjust accordingly. But the process is the same. And actually, I've done it with non-devotee children. And because it's the soul that is being attracted, it's actually, they're able to respond in a very, very genuine and very, very, uh, sincere way. So I really don't see much of a difference in the teaching process between 
from from devotee children to non devotee children so Machi, there's uh, one question on the chat box. Yes. Yamini Mataji wants to ask mm -hmm. how to train Srimad Bhagavatam stories for my 2.9 2 years old twin boys. Yeah, that's th almost three years old, right? You know, three months less, yeah. So um, again, that, that age children can respond a lot to, you know, things like um, pictures in the in the books and to art projects, you know, presenting the philosophy through art and art projects is a great way. And then the Srimad Bhagavatam guidebooks that our team is um, putting together is very handy in that respect because you'll get ideas for those activities which you can simplify for younger children and make it more uh, mature, uh, advanced for older children. Those same activities can be done. For example, in the first chapter where uh, Sutta Goswami is, uh, is nominated captain of the ship, you know, of, uh, then there's an activity where the children actually make a ship, you know, and, and they float it on the water. So they get the point that, wow, you know, and of course they have, they've gone through the entire chapter where all the qualifications of Sutta Goswami is being enumerated, you know, why he's qualified to become the teacher. The speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam is because of different points that we, we've already discussed in a very nice, demonstrative and, and uh, interesting way. You know, how he's submissive to his spiritual master, how he's well-versed in all the Shastra, all these qualities are there. So he becomes nominated. So you can make it very dramatic you know, also, you know, how Sutta Goswami is actually the captain of the ship of uh, the boat of Krishna consciousness. So we make a ship. So you see, a three-year-old uh, can, uh, and that's what they do in London, in the Baby Bhagavatam group. Every week, they present it to this age group, you know, where they're explaining these concepts, these difficult philosophical concepts through fun activities, okay? So Krishna consciousness, and I mean, uh, it's, it's just so much fun. And the child never forgets that, wow, you know, the sages were there in the first chapter. They're sitting there in Namish, in this forest of Namasharanya with Sutta Goswami as their leader. And what is Sutta Goswami doing? He's reciting Srimad Bhagavatam. And he's very qualified. So again, you're creating that picture. You can make an art project. You know, on a big sheet of paper, you can draw a forest from Nimesharanya or, or talk to him about it. So many wonderful imaginative ways. And don't think it's a waste of time because the child is so small. Anything about Krishna, Krishna is absolute and it goes straight to the heart. And it's, is helping, it's relating to the soul and the soul has no age or gender or anything, right? So you're, you're speaking to that soul, you know, within that body. So even a small child, you know, who can relate to this, can benefit, can make advancement, you know, through, uh, through this process of, uh, you know, of, you know, through the process of activities, okay? Just in using your imagination, and believe me, the time that you spend doing this with your little child, little children, then that will make you inspired, you see, as well. So if you, if you have one hour in the day, well, spend it something like that, okay? And there's so many other creative ways you can do it. Mataji, Achyut Prabhu has a question. I would like him to unmute himself and ask. Hare Krishna Mataji. Uh, sorry, I read you. I opened this meeting with my kid's name. His name is Achyut. Actually, I have a question. For that. Yeah, my son is less than five years old, and uh, like I want to know in which language we should tell him Bhagavatam in our mother tongue, or shall we go with English? Well, um, you know, I, if you're living in India, then you can, you know, if English medium is the medium that they are learning in school, then I would definitely try to do from a, a Prabhupada's uh, original book, you know, which is in English and, um, and teach from that book. However, teaching from your, from, 
in your own mother tongue from your from a book that's been translated is also okay it's also okay but if you have a you know if you are uh, comfortable with english then i would go ahead and do that okay because it will just uh, come in very handy in all aspects you know not just spiritual but also material aspects but there's no harm if you want to do it in your mother tongue but even when you're doing it in english in order to explain them well you may you may have to discuss it in your own mother tongue so you can flip back and forth you can read the translations uh, from Srila Prabhupada's book in English, but then you, as you explain to them and go deep, in order to get the point across, you can speak in your mother tongue. So you can do a combination of both, both English and your mother tongue, okay? If anyone else has any questions, kindly feel free to raise your hand and ask. Hare Krishna. Hare Bol. Hare Krishna. Yes. Uh, I'm really sorry, Mataji. I had another question. Uh, mm. I just wanted to uh, request you that, uh, mm. Mataji, I tried uh, purchasing your book, uh, um, which you spoke just now about guidelines for parents. Uh, for Bhagavatam, I was just trying to purchase it on Amazon, but it is not available. So what can I do, Mataji? I wanted to purchase that book. Yeah, I. what's happening is, yeah, due to the COVID situation, you know, things are so volatile. It's really difficult. But what I'm doing that within a month, you should be able to get these books from a publisher in India. So who's publishing the books now. So if you can just wait for a month, we are going through that process. And I can, um, you know, we can, and then you, it will be available. And you can all make a, like, you can come together and make a bulk order, or you can ask individually, everything will be available uh, in India at a very, a lot cheaper price, unbelievable price. This, I believe this publisher is working on that. Okay. I wanted to show you the screen of all the books we have. Let's see if I can do that. Somehow my screen is stuck. I'm not able to. So, and in the meantime, somebody can ask me a question. You know, if there is any, you know. Okay. Here are the books that are available. Well, it's not showing all the books, unfortunately, but you know, um, but there's Canto One, Two, Three. Yeah, Three is here, but the second volume of Three is also there. So these are the books that will be available after a month. Okay. Oh, okay, Mataji. Okay, Mataji. Thank, thanks a lot, Mataji, for enlightening us. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna. We would, I think we should conclude now, Mataji. Thank you okay. so much. Thank yes. you so much, Mataji, for your valuable time and such deep. I just wanted to hear. I wanted to hear from the teachers. Did they? Are they making? Uh, you know, if they are making the groups, then I'm. You know, I, I didn't hear anything from the teachers as yet. Are, are they there? <laughs> yes, Mataji, the teachers are there with us. Okay. If you all could, if you all want to add in something, uh, teachers of our group, please. I think everybody is very shy. Hare Krishna Mataji, Dandavat Pranam. Dandavat Prabhu. Thank you so much Mataji for a wonderful session. Uh, my name is Srinivas. If you, okay. uh, we discussed last time once on a WhatsApp call with Geeta Mataji, if you remember. Mm -hmm. so we started a, a new batch. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we started a new batch. Uh, I am conducting those uh, batches. So there is uh, one batch uh, uh, wherein the, the number of students is basically uh, around 15. So it was in between, basically. If we had more, then I would have split into two. And mm -hmm. it's 15. I can't do two also and then 
Uh, one yeah. is also not that challenging. I'm able to manage, but I just wanted to know if is it fine because I am ensuring all the kids will get chance to read. So that amount of tempo I'm maintaining, so that yeah. all the at least fifteen slokas are covered, so that fifteen kids can get the chance to read. Yes. But is that fine. Yes. Yes, Prabhu. It's just um, one has to just go by you know instinct. You know, like okay, fifteen verses. That's pretty good because if there's enough discussion. Uh, that needs to be done within those 15 verses is you they just get to read once but many times it happens that you cover 30 verses because there's not much of discussion that needs to be done then don't hesitate to do another round of reading this is my mood also when i do it it's like i make sure that nobody gets left out in the reading you know somehow we i everybody gets if we're making one turn then everybody gets to read one turn otherwise two turns you know uh, so that everybody feels satisfied and that you have to judge depending on the num amount of discussion that you can do, you know, uh, within those verses. So this yes, is fine. Mother. As long as you keep their interest going and they are enlivened and they keep coming back every week for more and more, then you know you're doing well. You see, this is your guideline. Okay, okay. Uh, just one more thing, Mataji, uh, that... Yeah. Uh, Regarding asking the uh, kids to share their realizations. So generally, mm -hmm. initially I was thinking, you know, we'll cover everything and do it towards the end. But then I realized that's not working. So yeah. I didn't think during the shloka only, if it mm -hmm. is some interesting point, then I then and there itself, I asked the kids to share any points around this. But I'm just sort of restricting it, okay, towards the end, if you can share something like this. Is that fine, Mathis? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is really good what you're doing. Yes. Sometimes this, we cannot have realizations class after each class. Okay. And, and generally what happens is when you finish the one chapter, like chapter eight, then you, the last class can be only realization class where you ask the children to think of different points and to jot it down and then speak up in the realization class. That is also very effective where you have a separate class for simply realizations class and the children have had all week to think about it and to you know write down some points you know so uh, and that's the end of the chapter so and it's amazing the type of realizations that come across now during the class like you said it's good to just do comments and discussion while you're doing the class where if you see a child is uh, is not speaking too much is not then you can, um, you know, as you're reading, as he's reading the verse, you can say, well, do you want to explain what this means? So the child gets excited and thinks, wow, you know, and then he tries to, sometimes he doesn't know what to say. So he simply repeats the translation, what Prabhupada has given, right? As it is, yes, yes. that's okay. You see, they'll do all that, but that's okay. The point is that you want to encourage the children to, to be active participants. And you speak want out. To, yeah. to speak out, to lose their, shyness in being able to think about it, think it through, you know, and to feel and to um, create, you know, and to answer questions and to make comments. And you're developing the confidence, their confidence in, in being devotees and being in, in, uh, in the ability to understand Srimad Bhavata, you know, you yeah. see? Yes, Mataji. Just one more question I'll ask. Oh, yeah, one. yeah. Go ahead, Prabhu. Yeah, no problem. So yeah. there is one obsession I have is that all the kids should equally participate. But there are always some kids, at least you will yes. find two or three maybe. They will, their answer would be generally yes, no, okay, that's it. They mm. don't share anything. And they are active on the video. I can see them. They are smiling and everything. But they're not really opening up in terms of uh, uh, sharing some points or experiences while many other kids are doing well. So yes. I don't know how to tackle this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a, well, you know, it takes a while and you'll see how these very children who are very shy, they actually start speaking out over time because they feel more inclined. And the, and the key thing is to keep encouraging them, even if they've sp spoken like a line. And if you can get even a few sentences, out, a few words out of them, you applaud that. You see, and that's, that's the way. If they're feeling shy because they're lacking confidence, yeah, in, in themselves. So you found that uh, in the, you encourage that confidence by uh, praising whatever they say. It may be something very simple, but immediately applauding and, and encouraging them and, and making them feel they're such wonderful children, you know? So, so as, you, as you keep encouraging, gradually they lose their shyness. And they, the other thing is, you know, when you do videos, it's really hard, isn't it? Sometimes because they do tend to get distracted with each other. 
and they watch each other and yeah. i don't know does it happen with you or no uh i haven't noticed uh, yet but uh, okay. could be yeah because sometimes without videos uh, without videos we have a feeling that it is much worst <laughs> really because i've been doing i've been doing for years and years and i only do audio oh is it and, okay. yeah i only do audio and i'm able to grasp you know get everybody's attention i don't leave any outside you know okay. they if they are more shy by nature then i don't push them very hard or anything like that but they end up just over a period of just a short period of time they end up losing their sh- shyness sometimes it takes longer depending on the child okay and you know so not every child will be the same but you can but i know video is more exciting for the children because they want to you know it's just something more but what happens is the the attention is diverted uh, and the the process of hearing is very powerful so when they just hear and not uh, you know zone out you know then it's the most effective but then you can try i i'm not saying that doing video is not good it it's probably also will work and it it is working for all of you but yeah you know, you know what i mean you can try both and see revisit uh, once and try once i mean that would be the best way to try out but at least yeah. with the video uh, we are definitely getting good response kids are participating and really? uh, but that fact is also true that uh, they could be just watching somebody else's video and then swiping here and there distractions mm-hmm. are possible that's yeah. very valid and and be very firm in that area when they get distracted just tell them don't be shy of telling them you see because you want to maintain that attention uh you know and children need gentle reminders they need sometimes strong reminders it's okay because ultimately um you then right after that you give them attention like you know they know that it's for their own good that um, so they don't mind uh, if if you need to become a little stronger to get their attention it's okay if that happens no okay. but but continue with the video i'm you know if it works because i know it's also works very well yeah yes not yeah yeah Just i know geeta can ask yeah yes please sorry for so many questions but no uh, no no it's, it's yeah uh, so for actually uh, we had uh, we had many subs- we had received many subscriptions and then based on the age we categorized it so we came up with a, a teenagers batch which is 12 oh. plus so 12 13 14 till 15 i think we have and uh, slowly that batch also increased and we have around 10 kids in teenagers batch that we are doing it mm-hmm. separately because we realized that initially it was a mix and then we could clearly see a disconnect and yeah. the teacher actually gets confused what so should i go philosophical that if i go philosophical then the uh, lower level kids are basically mm-hmm. confused and if we are too simple then the higher level kids are kind of getting bored so we thought we have to separate it but at, at least post separation it's i think uh, it's really working well um so with the higher end kids uh, that we have teenagers uh, the, the discussion is quite philosophical like for example the shloka where uh, dhruva desires to get a planet much higher than brahma ji so that's the point where i blowed up the three planetary systems and how it exactly happens where are we exactly and Good. Uh, yeah. ex- those points i blowed up and they enjoyed it and they were asking many questions so how is this and the nabhi is there and the lord vishnu is sitting over there okay this is just one universe okay there are many universes like that okay so it went it went it became interesting so mm-hmm. just want to share some realizations no this is wonderful what you're doing because some visuals also help very much they help to you know to to get their attention and to fix their attention it's very nice for what you're doing it's just you're using all kinds of creative ways to attract the child teenagers teaching teenagers is the most fun uh, it's the most Uh, can be challenging but also is so rewarding isn't it because these children are at that age where they're trying to make sense of this world you know and there's so many conflicting feelings conflicting feelings you know they've been going to school and they there's a certain different set of values over there and what we are telling them and what we practice at home is a different set of values you know how to make sense of all that you know then also content wise you know it's so different in terms of science and things like that so it's very challenging but i found that in this through the study of bhagavatam this gap narrows you know where children can really relate to their life as a devotee they can make sense to the idea, to yeah. the fact actually it's okay to be a devotee yes prabhu 
so it's very yes. nice mm-hmm. okay ma'am thank you so much we have your blessings we'll try doing thank no you. this group that uh, you're making in pune you know of, among all your teachers and it's amazing and i i was encouraging other people other parents to start other devotees to start, start groups like that um of 10 to 12 children of you know like he's had 15 also if they you can divide them then it's okay and to start this um st- systematic study of shrimad bhagavatam with the children and it becomes and and these parent and these teachers in pune are really finding a lot of success in in doing that and here was one teacher and there's other teachers and geeta gokhale is trying to spearhead this whole thing and she's willing to give these training sessions to anybody who's willing to uh, do this so please contact her and and uh, i'm also willing to i'm also at your disposal in case you need weekly help so but my request with everyone is to please uh, take this up and you'll see you'll find it so rewarding not only for the children for yourself this will become the highlight of your week it's just so so rewarding you know and and please engage all these children in in this very very uh, transcendental work which pleases shri prabhu so much teaching teenagers is so fruitful you know i remember when i have several groups of teenage children and the one thing that really stands out is you are really giving them so much conviction because very soon they will be they will fly their own nest you know they will be out of their nest sorry they will fly their own plane right and we would have very little inf- you know uh, to, you know influence on these children so giving them this faith will really help you know and i remember discussing all types of topics with them you know just openly openly you know about uh, girl boy relationships about household life or you know and, and so many things uh, the children are, sh- are shy to discuss but also they are so confused about right Yeah. Yes, Mataji. Mataji, actually, this teenagers batch we have kept the timing that we have kept is early morning, seven uh, o'clock, and many oh, kids really? end up struggling. <laughs> But somehow we convince them and they come on time. That is very nice. We wanted to keep it early so that the waking up early habit at least we are kind of implementing it on that day at least. Okay. Okay. Wow. That's ambitious. <laughs> ambitious pro- program. But yeah, if you can do it, it's so nice in the morning. uh yeah and this is also and and the parents uh, you know you have the support then i don't think it should be a problem otherwise it could be a problem yeah i guess mhm yes um, very mhm thank you much yes i would like to request uh, dipeshwari damodar priya mata ji to kindly raise her question she the teacher from our team mata ji oh great great Hare Krishna Mata Ji Dandrat Pranams um I reside in uh, Hyderabad currently so okay. I recently started this bedtime Krishna Katha for the kids here so there is mm-hmm. a Hyderabad congregation where I stay near Gachipoli so we have few families so the kids age is like probably 8 less than 8 5 year old till 15 year old max so it's so nice to receive the response and you know like and i'm so happy to announce that there's so many artists and uh, um in our group so i make like this powerpoint presentation where like as a i use a software called prezi and make it more like animated and you know interesting but it's so nice to actually more than they learn i i feel like i'm more inspired and more um you know i'm more inspired with the values and wisdom that they come out and they say you know because kids are so yeah. pure they don't say yeah. whatever they say it, it may it definitely touches your heart and um one of the kids was and i encourage elder kids at least once a week to share the stories to the younger kids so the kids will get in yes hi bo i lost you <laughs> uh, yeah i think you got disconnected from us this was really nice to hear from you uh, mata ji that you're feeling so inspired and that's what it does yes. teachers are more inspired than the children yes go ahead mata ji yes mata ji so so nice uh, you're doing this and you're teaching them bhagavata or what are you teaching them uh, 
I can't hear you. It's a bad connection. Oh, yeah, sorry, Mataji. So I'm I started out like after Dinmashtami, I started this group for bedtime Krishna Katha. So because as Prabhupada always encouraged to read before sleeping, so I think this like 15 minutes before okay. sleeping, like around 8 15, 8 20. So oh, nice. um so since it's mm -hmm. so yeah, I give, I shared them some other stories, you know, where I come across and I got a lot of inspiration from them, okay, like nice. Jagannath stories and all that, just like with uh, pictures and videos, so they get really attracted to that and, um, nice. and the elder yeah. kids also are very um, are very inspiring Mataji it's so inspiring that like the wisdom they shared is just so heart touching because they don't judge anyone you know, and as you grow up after teenage years because the things you see around, you that bias nature or that prejudgmental nature automatically comes in. But when you're growing up, they don't have these mentalities. They don't have these um, mm -hmm. uh, biased mentalities. But I'm so happy to, I want to be a teacher. I hope I become a good teacher in the future. And thank you so much for your association, Mataji. Very nice. Very good. Wonderful yes. contribution to our children. Especially when, when I, I, I do remember that even the evening time also becomes a very good time for, to do Bhagavatams, um, you know, because, and, and any other scripture, of course, is because children are done with the day and they are very much relaxed also, but not very late, but just enough where they you can still, after dinner, then they're ready, you know, to hear and to participate. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Divya Ji, Mataji, I would like to request you, and if there's a question. So I am also part of Gita Gokhila Mataji's group. So mm -hmm. we are uh, doing this, but I have a question regarding uh, what you answered to Srinivas Prabhuji, that we can have a realizations mm -hmm. class only. So uh, actually when I do the, uh, uh, when I conduct this regular class and I ask the kids that uh, what, what, do, what do you remember from the past class? So, you know, sometimes it's hard from them for, from their side, but when I, when I give some hints, then they start picking it up and okay, yeah, we did this last time and like that. So for this realization class, like, uh, uh, how do we uh, like do we give them uh, do we tell them that you read by yourself uh, revise it and come or how do we do it because it, it may be hard from for, for them to recollect everything that has been happening from two, two months like that no no yeah no don't give them too much um, stress because of that you know it should be something spontaneous that they liked um, that they remember in all the chapters, you know, what stood out for them? What is it that made a difference in their life? How did it change them, you know? So more, it's more introspective rather than the details of what they liked. If they were to just tell us that, oh, I like this part when uh, Dhruva goes to the forest and he meets Narad Muni. Well, everybody knows that part. But what we want to hear from them is how they, what, what is it? during that conversation that struck the, him the most, that struck the child the most, you see? So it's more like a personal um, realization, a personal reflection, rather than warn them not to, that you don't want to hear the story, the story or the story plot, what's happened and then this happens and that happens. No, you're not, in the realizations class, you want to hear from their reflection of the story, what they learned from the story what affected their life, you know, uh, in terms of Dhruva, in terms of Dhruva, you see? Otherwise they'll come with pages and pages of uh, words, which is basically a repetition of what they, of the story. And you can keep, you see? So keep it effortless. Don't make it like a textbook because then it's a lot for them. But you'll see, um, they'll come up with some amazing, amazing realizations, you know? Like the, the Mataji before this said, you know, you just feel so inspired to hear from the innocent minds, but uh, you know, how much deeply they've taken. And sometimes their realization is as good as an adult realization. It's the same, practically. Yes, Mataji. Yeah, even mm -hmm. I have experienced that more than the story, they like uh, what they have learned from it, like uh, yes. not to be envious. That is uh, what, like if one child says that then, 
many repeat also that yes we also like this point that we should not be envious of others so mm -hmm. i also mm -hmm. yes yes So anything else? Because one thing that the teachers can do in terms of this Druva chapter is to actually, um, you know, make different things, you know, make, make different points and to discuss them at the end of the chapter, you know, all the different lessons that we learned from the story. So towards the end, uh, the teacher can do something like that, like where I pointed out the different, some of the different lessons, you know, how um, she, you know, how, material the mater solutions to material desires uh, material uh, material problems uh, have spiritual solutions but not material solutions you know things like that and then we can put the different lessons that children learn from the story and that kind of sums up everything you know that um, um, that can it helps develop the sum it kind of summarizes everything so that's another way also to do you can ask the children in one of the classes all the different lessons that they learned and then to jot it down and bring it all together, you know, the different lessons. And there's many, many lessons. If you want to teach them value-based education, that's a great way to do it. But not, un yeah, not until, to, uh, until they finished it. Yeah. I would request Radha Chandrika Masri to raise a question, please. Hare Krishna Mathur, thank you very much for your uh, enlightening session. Um, uh, I have a question like, how do you structure your uh, class? Like you said, you are having 10 batches of like 100 kids you are teaching Srimad Bhagavatam. So what mm -hmm. is the structure you follow for a class? Uh, yeah, so what it is, is that I do one, one a day and that's one hour class. So I don't take more than that. So I take out one hour of my day every day and teach one batch. So, so it's covered in this way. And every batch doesn't exactly have 10. There's some with 12, 13, you know. Uh, so it adds up to like, you know, close to 100. So, so in this way, I'm giving once a day an hour with so many groups like that. So which is like, Okay, about 100 would mean 10 groups or nine groups like that. Well, there's more than 10 in each group, you see? So you can do the same. You can do an hour every day and you can have six or seven groups. You see? Okay, um, uh, my question is like, what, like, um, how do you go about that in one hour class? Uh, you will take Bhagavatam and uh, make them re go through the translations because I haven't attended your um, the class or I don't know how actually these classes are run. So I just well, want see, to get an idea what you do. In the yes, yes, Madhi. What I, I was planning to read the verses as we go, but because we hadn't planned that every parent, uh, whoever is there can participate in that and all of you read one verse each. It would have been a lot easier to do it that way. But what you do is you read the verse, the child reads the verse, and then in the puppet, you, ahead of time, you see the points that you think would be good for discussion. Okay, Mataji? And then you note it on the side of the page where, oh, this is the point I want to discuss. Okay? So you note it down. Mm. You know, you note it down. Okay. For example, um, okay, for example, in one verse where Suniti talks about, she discourages Dhruva to uh, go to any demigod, but instead to go to uh, Krishna, you know, for her problems. Mm. And to establish that point, she's bringing Paramparayan. She's bringing the example of his grandfather and his great grandfather. See, they didn't go to anybody. They didn't go to the demigod, but they went to Krishna and they pleased Krishna through their austerities. They pleased Krishna. And that's why Krishna rewarded them with uh, so much, you know, you know, so, so in this way, she's establishing the fact that 
like the like your forefathers you should also go to krishna okay and don't be sidetracked you see so you so from that verse and purport you can do that and that's text 21 so as you're going you take a, see in the beginning i encourage parents or teachers to read ahead of time because then you establish your confidence that person can mute herself you know wherever the noise is coming from is there any way they can be muted or something i don't know if you can so so in this way you know that um you know you read the purport that's why i encourage parents or teachers to read it initially at least you know so that you develop the confidence of this process of how to discuss because once you've read it and you say wow yeah this is a great point to discuss you know that one should how krishna is so going to krishna is never a loss because krishna will fulfill all the desires but in a way that's going to be beneficial to us is going to purify our hearts at the same time you know but demigods when we go there they do not purify our hearts they may give what we need but that going to, that's going to be a source of entanglement whereas when you go to krishna he he fulfilled the desire of dhruva but at the same time purified his heart where he didn't want anything you see so you think of that point and then you you learn a creative way of how to discuss that it's very simple really so you go through all these translations but then every translation doesn't need a discussion right because there may not be points like that um you know then the point about where propa talks about mere lamentation is useless how mother and son did something with with their life right so that also can be discussed so like this you go through every every one of them and 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 do, and note down what you need to discuss with them so you'll develop your confidence you know and there's so many things you know his meeting with narad muni is also very very instructive you know how the relationship between guru and disciple you know comes through his determination comes through you know his his uh, honest uh, his honesty you know in in accepting the fact that he had material desires you know and he wanted those material desires to be fulfilled but in an honest way in a way where you know where he wanted to please krishna he was crying for krishna and that's why krishna made himself available to him you know so many points are coming through right so you go through these verses mataji and when you read the purports even if you were to glance all some of them and not able to read all of them you see that how you know once you get the start off by immersing yourself in bhagavatam you'll see the inspiration to teach will come you see you find a little bit of time to immerse yourself to absorb your heart into this into this into that story that you're going to be teaching and then you'll see that when you're teaching the children the inspiration will be there okay and your inspiration when you teach them will be doubled literally doubled okay and that enthusiasm passes on to the children when they see the teacher enthusiastic the children become very enthusiastic thank you mathuji i also the teachers would like to know mathuji that uh, like they have to cover only the translation and discussion on translations or uh, do they have to do the activities also like in your book there are activities behind every chapter well no uh, like i said if you are, you can follow both processes uh, you know um, where you don't have to do every activity but you can just what you could do is go through this methodology of discussion and opening their minds and the, and then uh, you can also do some of the activities not all of them things that you can do online there are some hands on activities that you cannot do you see hands on activity that you cannot do online but you can do certain other activities that become very uh, you know that can be done um, through the through the you know through the guidebooks so you yes, don't have please. to do yes dada chandrika mathuri you want to ask something else also yes yes yeah yes okay. thank you mathuri for the elaborate answer uh, like uh, would we go like theme wise like dhruv maharaj prahlad maharaj or uh, do we go by uh, canto wise how how would you suggest what would you suggest yeah i would suggest start with dhruv maharaj 
and Prahlad Maharaj, like these stories, begin with that, you know, get the attention of the children, attract their hearts. And then as the children become, um, you know, more familiar with this philosophy and everything, then go back to Canto 1, Chapter 1. That's what I did. You know, I start out with these stories with children and then I see their maturity. And then I start, you know, with, I've done that with a few batches. With one batch, I, we are on 11th Canto, you know, and uh, almost to the end. And we've been doing like for the fa last what, five years and we're finishing the Bhagavatam now. So as these children, yeah, so as these children are getting older, you can imagine, uh, you know, the inspiration they've been having and their faith in Bhagavatam is being more and more developed. So this is like, if you're starting out with a child that's, you know, nine years old, I mean, in four or five years, they would have read the entire Bhagavatam, you see, uh, with you, because you're reading all the translations as well. They're reading that, right, in discussion. And then by the time they become, do, they go to college, they would have read and understood the Bhagavatam in a way that's going to be, they're going to practically apply it. And then as they get older, in the youth and everything, they're going to read it again, right? Hopefully they're going to read, uh, they will, because they, they've been attracted. I know a few children who have, they have to leave this, this class because of something which they just miss it. I know a few children who come back, you know? So, because they, they work in college is getting too complicated and school or something. But I would not recommend, I would re recommend that the parents and teachers encourage the children to keep going and to find the time not to give up Shastra. Okay. Thank you very much, Mataji. Thank you very much for your wonderful association. Mataji, a parent has a question that if you yeah. want to daily read, read out Srimad Bhagavatam to kids, how should mm -hmm. the parent schedule her time so as to for the self-study as well as to teach Bhagavatam to her child? Mm. Uh, self-study, yes. So, uh, Mataji, the way my life was with my children was I had, and we were running a preaching center, so we had no time. I had no time to study on my own, you know, with children, with housework, with, you know, work, you know, festivals and so much preaching activities and deity worship and so many things were going on. So I, I, what I did was uh, I, I just read with them. And that was my Bhagavatam time. See, that's what I'm saying, that if you really get absorbed in teaching in, in an inspirational way to your children, that will bring so much inspiration to you as well. And there will be no difference between your own self-study and teaching the children, you know? And this is the only way I read Bhagavatam, you know, when my children were growing up is reading with them. And we used to study Bhagavatam like two hours a day, read this, this pro do this process. And, and this is how I covered the entire Bhagavatam. So this absolutely okay to do that way. And see what happens is as you're doing it, the topics, the, the ability to dive deeper becomes bigger and bigger. So with the result that you're going deeper, it's not like you are at the child's level, you're actually at a adult level because the children's capacity to understand these adult issues is getting deeper and deeper. It's like Prahlad, it's like Dhruva, they were, so learned, right? They were great devotees, but they were still children, you know? They were still children. It's not like we take away their childhood. In fact, we enhance their childhood. But isn't, that's how the Acharyas were in their childhood were, were like? They would play with the Krishna dolls, but they, they were children, but yet they were uh, very Krishna conscious, right? This is, this is childhood. This is actually real childhood. Childhood does not mean frivolous activities, nonsensical activities. Yes, children need to play though, because the play helps them to develop their imagination. Nothing wrong with that. But if we fill that time with just frivolous things, you know, when we think this is childhood, it's actually not childhood. Real childhood is what we can learn from these great souls, the way they spend their childhood, you know? So, um, so we encourage our children to actually um, study these books and then to apply these teachings of these books in practical ways, in practical ways, by celebrating a festival, doing a drama. This is application of the philosophy. 
you know, giving a class or, or participating in a drama, helping out with a festival, cleaning, cooking, you know, uh, preaching, going out to present Krishna conscious philosophy with an adult, right? So this is all fun time. It's not like we're always sitting with books. Most of the time we are doing practical things, right? Yes, Matsri, thank you so much. So Matsri, like, uh, like you were mentioning that the parents should set aside a time, like, you know, for studying themselves, preparing themselves before they start explaining to the children. So mm -hmm. it's okay, like you mean to say, just the parent can just sit with the child and same time, they yeah. read together and start explaining. Okay. Yeah, if you don't have time to prepare ahead of time, it's okay. And I did that in my days with my children. Uh, but now that I have so much, I'm doing more. I mean, I realized that um, it, it just, the discussion becomes a little deeper. But at the same time, it can be done because this is how I did it without any preparation. I would just sit with them. But because we are older, we have a lot more to share and the children benefit greatly. They all benefit, you know, my children came out, you know, uh, being, understanding Bhagavatam and applying it in their life is still going to be very valuable if you were to do that. And sometimes when the questions come and you're not able to answer, at that point, you can read the purport with them. You see, you can read it to them and say, oh, okay, this answer is right here where Prabhupada is saying that yes, uh, it should be, it, it, it can be like this. You see, so you can read it right on the spot over there, some purports, you know, if you, if you, if you feel the need for doing that, you know? Just life's experiences will bring you those, those uh, realizations. Thank you so much. So Mataji, any uh, particular time slot to be maintained daily, like, you know, half an hour, for one hour? Yeah, for well, yeah. if the teachers are giving this, obviously you have to uh, plan your time accordingly with all the children, you know, when is the best time to do a group class. And for parents, you just pick out the best time in the day that you can spare, you know, whether it's evening, morning, you have to see that what is the best time? It doesn't really matter if it's not, uh, if it's during the day or night or evening time, you know, as long as that it's the time where every child is relaxed and you're relaxed and you can uh, expand their minds, you see? Uh, you know, so you can see, I mean, obviously the first thing in the morning is very nice because the mind is very tuned in for understanding spiritual things, you know? So that's a great time to do that. But if you cannot, then don't get discouraged. Like, see, the classes that I have, I can only spare evening. So I do it in the evening. So, and the children are just as alert. I mean, I don't see them, them slacking off, you know. Um, so do, do what you can the best way. But what I would do is be determined to do it, though. Not that you skip it all together because it's too troublesome or too difficult. Right, Masri. Any ideal duration also suggested by you? Yes. The time I would say, I saw, I've seen that between 45 minutes to an hour is great, you know? And like if you're doing a chapter or something, then, well, a chapter like this one, like eight chapters, very, very long. So this would, I would divide it into two, two turns, two turns, or maybe it could be three sometimes, you know? Uh, yeah, it's quite, I think it's 80 verses or something. So it's quite a few. So, but most chapters you, one is able to do within an hour in one hour. So, um, and you know, many chapters you just have to read fast. I mean, you just go through without discussion, little discussion, sometimes chapters where the, this prayer is being offered by the demigods to Krishna or by some other devotee. So they, we just have them read and, but we pick out the essential things in order to discuss. For example, in the Ritha Sura story, in the Narayan Kavach uh, chapter, you know, the, where Vishwarupa is giving them the Narayan Kavach for protection against the demons. Uh, in that chapter, the demigods are offering the prayers and it's one after another, these prayers where they're invoking the Lord in his different features, in his different incarnations. And so we just read through that, but there are certain amazing points in those prayers. So we just bring that out. You know, come, you know, where the demigods are praying for the Lord to, uh, you know, they're praying to actually the club of the, of the Lord, you know, where, and they're praying to the, uh, that the Lord use that club to pound 
the, the demons to pieces, to pulverize them. So it was very interesting where we took that point and we started discussing about, you know, oh, um, see, demigods want the demons finished, but a pure devotee doesn't even pray for that. He doesn't want the, the Lord to smash the demons. So this is the difference between the mentality and the mental makeup of a mixed devotee versus a pure devotee like Prahlad. Right, Prahlad is praying, so you can make comparisons. It becomes so effective. Every story, you can bring in other stories and you can ask them, instead of telling them, you can ask them, do you remember any other story in which this happened? And they'll come, come with that type of example. They'll come and they get so excited. And there's 10 different examples and you'll find all these 10 children giving each one and you give them one turn for one uh, example each only. So everybody gets a turn and then, you know, they give that example. Oh yes, in this story, it's very, you know, this, this similar thing happened, right? So like that, and, and then you can make comparisons. Okay, Prahlad would not pray like this, but the, uh, you know, our devotees, will, you know, demigods pray like that, you know? So we see the mentality, but yet the devotees, and we also are, can relate with them because we also have desires, material desires, right? So another way we also develop the element of compassion and how every devotee at every stage is eligible to go to Krishna for help, you know, and, and develop that compassionate mood. Like through the Dhruva story, you see the, de the compassionate mood that uh, is de being developed in this story where Dhruva has material desires and he's actually wants to finish off his stepmother and get rid of her and all those things. He's coming with so much revenge in his heart but then how it, and we have compassion for him because he's been hurt, right? He's been terribly hurt. We so, don't see him as a demon or anything. Even Suruchi, you know, ultimately we see her with compassion, you know? She did suffer the reaction. So we're, you're developing that mood of compassion also simultaneously in the children. But this element of comparison from one story in, for, to another and seeing the different points, just discussing them, brings the children um, that element of compassion, helps develop that compassion and, and a deeper understanding of uh, more critical thinking uh, is developed through these stories. Okay. Thank you so much, Mataji, for the detailed answer. It was beautifully explained. Mataji, there's one, shall we conclude with one last question from the chat box? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, the question is, what is the ideal age to start proper study of Bhagavatam from Canto 1 for kids? Okay, well, I would say that, uh, like I said, there's a group in London, which is called Baby Bhagavatam Group, and they've got children as young as three to five, or maybe six, and, and they're doing it. So it depends how you want to do it. You know, you'll have to use more creativity in teaching children who are very young, you know, but definitely it becomes easier when they're able to read. And so I would say more like seven, uh, or, you know, more like seven. Uh, if you're doing an online class for them collectively, I would not uh, take very small children because on an online, it's very difficult to keep them together and to get them disciplined. Uh, you can try that, you know, and see if it works. But generally, starting the age of seven is very effective or even eight. Even seven is okay. Yeah, as long as they can read with the parents' help. Now, if the children cannot read well and you have to help them each, every few words, it's not a good idea. Then a parent, then you should take a child who's a little bit more, you know, better at reading, then start at that age. But if the parent just, but if the child is just getting stuck with a few words here and there, then the parent can sit next to the child and uh, prevent and help the child to pronounce those words. Because if the teacher is doing that, then it becomes like an English class. So we have to try to avoid that situation. And sometimes the children will read wrong and will carry on. It's okay, you know, it's okay. We are trying to get the essence and we're not trying to make a language class out of this. We, we, we cannot forget the purpose behind the whole thing, you know? So for small children, I, if they are having difficulty, either they wait, you know, a few months or they, um, if they're getting stuck with very few words and the parent can help. All right, Master. Thank you so much, Mataji, for the wonderful, wonderful session. It was a detailed and very practical one. 
we would like to wholeheartedly thank you for the demo class and uh, we request you to kindly guide us in future too thank you very much for allowing me to share uh, here and looking forward to many many groups of ch children studying bhagavatam uh, you know so uh, hope to hear from all of you and the good news hari krishna yes, have you had Thank you for your blessings. We thank all the participants for having joined us today. Thank you, everyone. Hare Krishna. Dhanwad. Yeah.